and by just giving us an overview of what's happening in the ESG space in generally. And then I will also tell us the trends to watch out for, what, what we see that's going to happen in 2023 and in the near future, right? And so before I get started, I just want to also make sure we are all on the same page on ESG. Perhaps this, this particular part is for you. <laughs> um, so what is ESG? Why does it matter? Why should we care? <laughs> Especially as Kenyans, I mean, we found out at COP27 that uh, Africa contributes to this 4% of global carbon emissions. So why should we care? I mean, we are, we are the good guys, right? Um, and so I'll, I'll just say ESG, really is about information, it's about data. Yeah. Once upon a time, people really did not consider some of this non-financial information when making economic decisions, investment decisions, but that's changing, right? Um, and it's changing for a variety of reasons. So we have governments who are looking at how environmental issues, people, society, um, corporate governance issues actually affect or are affected by the economy. And then we have investors who have changed their view, some while they are ahead of us when it comes to our impact investors, but everyone is actually starting to look at how these environmental issues, these social issues, these governance issues actually impact the longevity of a company, the ability for a company to stay competitive and to, I mean, continue practicing for as long as possible. So it's not just about your, your value per share the next quarter, it's really, is this company going to be there 10 years from now? because it's either been gotten out of the market because the, the regulatory space has changed or they're no longer competitive, right? And so these are the broad, I've tried to summarize in pictorial form what, what these issues cover, but I don't think I can even begin to like really summarize it. But in terms of the E, we're looking at things like climate stability, you know, where we're looking at our, emus our emissions. Um, we're looking at waste management, and this is a big one in Kenya. I'll be talking about this uh, slightly. We're looking at natural resources, renewable energy, um, and these are the conversations that people are having. When it comes to the social aspect, it's the human capital element, right? It's it's your your human resource, both from um, your people who you're taking on. Are you are you incentivizing them the right way so that you continue being an innovative company that will stay relevant for as long as possible? Um, we're also looking at your how you're interacting with your consumers and the, the community in which you operate. We're looking at diversity and inclusion, which is a big conversation, not just here, but globally. And then also health and safety. You know, uh, people took for granted this particular piece um, and it's becoming a big issue. And you find people when they're doing their due diligence are actually also coming and looking at this particular point because it's becoming a big issue just globally. And then governance, I think, is the thing that we all are very aware of. Um, because this really affects how are we running our company? Are we making the right decisions at the right level? Is there transparency? Um, are we compliant with the regulations that are in place? Uh, it, here we also have anti-bribery and corruption, which goes towards governance as well. And actually just a fun anecdote um, on this point. So uh, ESG apparently, uh, the, the Paul Clements Hunt who allegedly, I don't think I'll be a good lawyer if I don't use allegedly once <laughs> in the conversation, but allegedly coined the phrase ESG. Um, it uh, claims that initially it was going to be GES, and the reason being they thought the governance portion is actually the most important element, um, because without the governance, you're not really actually sorting out the environmental issues, you're not sorting out the social issues. But apparently GES doesn't roll off the tongue quite the right way, it wasn't sexy enough, and so they thought E is the sexy word to put first, but EGS didn't work and they were afraid that people might call it eggs. So <laughs> then we have, that's how we ended up with ESG. So if anything, at the end of the day, um, remember that ESG is the sexier acronym um, and you can go and take that with you and, and share and teach people. Um, and so what's happening in the ESG space in Kenya? Interesting enough, I know Paris mentioned that this is a new concept. I think it's just, being broached as a, an acronym in Kenya in the, more, in the more recent past, but it's actually not new. A lot of these ESG elements are completely embedded in our laws, they've been entrenched for a long time. And just to even show you, I'll, I'll give you a summary. And this is literally a summary. I just picked up what I thought were the key pieces of legislation in this space, but it doesn't actually cover everything. So like on the environmental space, we have our constitution and I think our constitution cuts across the board, right? So you, um, under there you have entrenched your right to uh, a clean 
environment, right? Um, you have various rights that are entrenched in the constitution. We have our Environmental Management and Coordination Act. I think this is the overarching act that actually deals with environmental management in Kenya. We have our waste management in there. We have all the permits. And I think this is an act that cuts across industry. So very many people have had to get one permit or the other from NEMA. Uh, we have the Climate Change Act. So this one is really what is the government is using to implement some of their climate change um, action, action plans. Uh, and, and, and so this is an interesting one because we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about later about just the National Climate Change Action Plans, and that's something that everyone I think should be reading. The, the latest one was 2018 to 2022, so we're about ready for the new iteration, uh, but it actually gives you a very good insight as to the things that government is going to be implementing uh, in the next iteration, right? And then this one, the Sustainable Waste Management Act actually came into place last year, um, and this is an interesting one as well because they are now looking towards the push towards the circular economy, ensuring that nothing is, is left to waste, right? Um, and it actually is going to impose uh, new obligations on private entities that people need to be aware of. There are regulations that are going to be published. They're actually due to be published now because it was six months from when it came into place. And it's going to put some interesting things on, uh, interesting obligations on private entities. So we're going to wait and see what the private entities they're going to um, put them on, sorry. Uh, there. So some of the some of the obligations they're putting on private entities is that they have to adopt a waste management plan, a three-year waste management plan, and failure to do so actually has very heavy fines. We're talking about five percent of your turn your revenue basically for the previous year. So that is that is a huge impact, or five million shillings, whichever is higher, right? And so most likely the five percent would be higher. So this is something that people need to be aware of. That's coming into place. Uh, and then there are other obligations, including um, that they're, they're putting in, you have to adopt cleaner production principles. So you have to improve your production lines, basically, and kind of show how you're doing so. Uh, your conservation of raw materials. And another interesting thing, actually, is it's, it's putting on the burden on you in relation to your waste products. So it's not just on the consumer. You've sold your, your bottle of water to the consumer. How this bottle actually gets dealt with and disposed of becomes the producer problem because it's a producer, producer responsibility. So they have extended producer responsibility. Um, and so this is a, going to be an interesting one to watch. I put the Fisheries Act in there because the, just to uh, give an example of laws that people don't think of in an environmental perspective, but it really is because you have to get certain permits and they put certain quotas on how you're able to fish and exploit basically your water. So this is moving towards blue economy. Um, it's, uh, by the way, that's another thing about this space. Lots of interesting words. We talk about circular economy, blue economy, GRI report, GRI reporting. Like it's lots of acronyms. I'm going to try not to use the the industry speak, um, but I think it's it's an interesting one to think. So social, we all know, um, Kenya has very interesting um, is interesting in this space because our employment act and we have been very employee friendly in our legislation and in our litigation as well. We have the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which has been in place for a very long time. Um, and so we actually get investors coming in and when we tell them about the provisions, they're like, oh no, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not um, in a manufacturing space. I don't need to be registered on the ocean. We tell them actually, you know, this applies to all employers um, and, and they get shocked by that. But that's an interesting thing. We have the Work Injury Benefits Act. I'm putting data protection in there just under social because this is, this is now a big key space, right? Um, we had uh, Ariana is here who, who just went and said, hey, our data protection expert, and she'll tell you employer, employee data, client data, as long as you're dealing with personal data, you have to have these policies in place. You have to have the provisions in place. There's no escape now. We have complied with the same things that we're seeing in Europe with the GDPR. So um, again, data protection. So governance, as I said, is the space that um, we are all aware of. We have the Companies Act which places certain obligations on directors. Um, we have the Capital Markets Act that uh, deals with our listed companies and some of our regulated um, uh, entities in the financial services space, the Corporate Governance Court, the Banking Act uh, with the Prudential Guidelines, all these things that are regulating really things in the governance space. Um, and again, this is just a, a snapshot, right? So as I said, it's not new, it has been here. The only the difference is we are seeing companies moving 
beyond just compliance because this is what investors and financiers are, are looking for. They want you to be compliant, yes. But over and above that, what are you actually doing um, to, 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 meet with, to meet up with what's happening globally? Uh, and so in that regard, I actually want to talk about this, the, the current government and the interest that it has actually put in this space. Um, interesting thing is uh, our president, in his speech, his, one of his first speeches, which was at the UN General Assembly, actually did talk about climate change and made certain commitments this, gov this government wants to do towards climate change. So climate change, he said, is one of the greatest challenges that connects the world. And he he and he's constantly speaking about this. So it just shows you the kind of interest that they're having in this space. Um, he reiterated this again uh, last year in like two of his speeches. One at the Mashudrade speech, in which case he said the government is actually looking at how so, um, climate issues actually affect the socioeconomic um, area, and you know, of, uh, of climate in Kenya, and the things that the government the government is going to play a proactive role in being in this space and putting in incentives for private industry. Um, and so again, just shows you where government is going towards this. Uh, he made certain commitments like 5 billion trees in five years, um, in which case he actually indicated he wants to partner with private industries. And I'll tell you what some of the incentives that they have actually put in a draft policy document for comment, which will include some tax incentives, breaks that you could take advantage of if you're partnering with government in this particular space. Um, another interesting thing is at COP27, UK and Kenya um, agreed, or there was um, an agreement to fast track certain projects in, in this particular space. So we're talking about clean energy, agriculture, transport, and this was worth 500 billion trillion. So again, shows you where really the, 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 the world is. And, and, and this was actually, all this project are to enable an acceleration of climate finance in the country, right? So interesting thing to see. Um, and uh, again, I'm, I'm going to talk about this, but Kenya intends to accede to the agreement for the establishment of the Global Green Growth Institute, GGDI, another acronym. <laughs> um, and so this is an intergovernmental international organization that's been set up to actually push sustainable economic growth in emerging markets. And part of this is what I'm going to tell you about the draft policies that they put in place. So if we accede to this, um, they have encouraged, they, uh, they have welcomed comments from the general public in relation to the draft policy document. So this is something that I think everyone should read because it's actually going to have an impact on private industry, on uh, accessibility to credit, um, and, and just some of the government initiatives that they're, that they're doing in this space. Uh, yeah, sorry, just to go back a bit. Um, I wanted to talk about the listed companies. So as, as um, Paris rightly said, uh, there was an ESG disclosure manual that was published by the, the NSC requiring listed companies to make ESG disclosures, which is again very new. And last year was the deadline for them to do, <laughs> to make the initial disclosures. Uh, by December, so the, the deadline was actually in November. By early December, not all listed companies had complied with, uh, with the obligation. And uh, with the reports that are coming in, people chose to, to, to basically approach it in different ways. So we had certain companies that um, put it in as part of their financial reporting. So their annual, their annual report has a sustainability portion and they put it in there. While well, you have other companies that have a whole sustainability committee or a head of sustainability and they published full on reports just on sustainability. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see how now that the reports have gone in, and this has been the first year of reporting, how the NSC is going to respond to this, especially since they have indicated or, or, or announced plans to publish now an index um, on, on, on how companies are doing in relation to their climate change agenda. So um, obviously the reports feed into the, the index. The index goes into your ratings. Your ratings will affect things like accessibility to finance and actually investor interest in, in your company moving forward. So um, that's an interesting thing to see. And lastly, I just want to talk about the banks. Now, uh, CBK, uh, uh, last year again as well, there was um, a requirement to, for banks to indicate what their climate change mitigation measures are, right? Um, and there was a guideline on what they need to, to look at. 
the interesting thing about this is it, it might seem peculiar, but it's actually a trend that's happening globally. And I'm sure you guys can talk about what's happening in, in England as well. But um, the, uh, this has a big thing on what we're actually going to be talking about today in, in relation to sustainable finance. Sorry. Uh, so uh, just to give you a, a flavor of what's happening globally, uh, last year, again, the Federal Reserve Bank actually made, made the same request for some of the six of their largest banks. They were told to collate data on things that to do with climate mitigation risk. So in their case, they were a bit more specific. And so they had to think about physical risk, right? So um, looking at your assets, looking at your portfolio, how will you be impacted by climate change? It seems far out there, but an example I would like to give is uh, the floods that happened in Durban. So you have banks that have taken out security and real estate assets, and then you have floods happening and that actually affects your loan portfolio, right? And the security you've taken. And so if you've not really thought about uh, climate risk and how it affects, um, when you're looking at your credit risk, then, then now this is the time and this is what really banks globally have been asked to do. Um, and then now in terms of the transition plans, we might not be there necessarily in Kenya, but when we're looking at the move towards uh, renewable energy, banks are also looking at, do you have assets that in a few years time might not be worth their salt if um, you've, um, uh, uh, loaned heavily to a coal mine, although now <laughs> that's a, a question with some of them being fired up again. But again, looking at the transition plans, what what is your what, are you looking at the risks associated with climate change and the change that's happening globally when you're looking at your loan portfolio? So uh, this climate uh, uh, stress is actually happening globally, um, and so the Central Bank of Kenya is very much in line with what's happening globally. Uh, again, last year was the first time banks were asked to do this. Um, uh, some of them responded by, again, putting in some green products in the market. Um, and, and we have them, this report aren't out publicly yet, so we don't really know what mitigation risks they've put in place. But it's just an interesting thing to see. So in terms of trends uh, for 2023 and beyond, what we're seeing is going to happen. <laughs> or is definitely in place. Um, I already talked about the NSC Climate Change Index. So I think uh, this is going to link to more standardized reporting um, because as I said, this first year, people didn't really have an idea of what they're going to, how they're going to report, right? So people took very different approaches to it, including how much they were disclosing. And as much as the, the, the guideline does have some mandatory disclosure requirements, Again, very different approaches were taken. So I think we're going to have to standardize. If we're going to have an index, then we need to have some form of standard of what is being reported. Um, in this regard, for, for private companies, uh, last year, the uh, DG of the National Treasury made some interesting remarks in relation to nine financial um, issues being captured in our accounts. Um, so it's a question as to whether eventually they're looking at putting in Again, same EHT kind of disclosures in your financial reporting that you actually then have to file at the company's registry. Um, that's yet to be seen. He just made the comments, but he was giving some sort of indication as to how government is thinking that it shouldn't just be limited to our public listed companies. And this is information that's going to be used by everyone because, again, you are filing these um, reports with our company's registry. Uh, so another thing we're going to see is just se uh, sectoral uh, climate change mitigation. So sectors banding together, they want to influence basically how, um, one of the things we want to do is influence how government is thinking about some of these issues. Um, they're already seeing the, the signs of what government wants to do. So for example, we have the aviation industry that has come together. Um, and they have actually uh, uh, put together uh, their, their goals in relation to um, their carbon emissions mm -hmm. and people are signing onto that. Um, and then we have Kepro. This is actually um, set up, it was I think an initiative with CAM and it's been set up in, in response to the Sustainability Waste Management Act. So this is the, KEPRO is the Kenya Extended Producer Responsibility Organization. It's a bit of a mouthful, so KEPRO just works better. Um, and they're dealing with sustainable packaging because, again, this is they're seeing you see the signs, you respond to it. And so um, you have manufacturers joining this 
this organization and their other um, uh, extended, uh, extended pr producer responsibility organizations also being formed that are more sector specific. Uh, and so again, we're gonna see more, more people coming together to deal with what's happening in, in the market, what government is putting together, especially from the tax, from the tax front. Um, and then now the government incentives. Uh, and this is something I would encourage everyone to look at. They have they put out the draft policy framework under the GGGI and the deadline for comment is 2nd of March. So as Bowman's, we are actually also uh, putting together our thoughts and our comments on this. Now, at this point in time, this is a, a, what I call a wish list by government. This is what they're saying. This is what we're going to do. This is how we think we're going to deal with this thing. But a lot of these policies are going to actually come into place. And just to give you an example of some policies, um, I've seen this in the Business Daily this week. They, they do want to add a congestion charge scheme for cities. So this is about, will you be able to drive your car in the city? And will you be paying an extra tax because then you're, you're contributing to our carbon emissions? Uh, how is that going to be implemented? That's going to be interesting to see, but they have put it in there. They do want to design some sort of carbon tax scheme in Kenya. Um, again, are we going to, are we overtaxing our people? But this is again, revenue generation in a way to also push us towards climate, uh, the climate change goals. Uh, they have indicated that they do want to develop a green investment bank. Um, and and uh, I, I did see another policy document indicating that this might be in conjunction with other East African countries, but um, it is part there. Uh, they want to establish and finance a green special economic zone. So we already have the SEZs in place, but now they want to actually also establish a specific, a green one. And, and there'll be certain um, uh, criteria you have to meet to be able to, to, to be in the green special economic zone, but over and above that, then you get additional incentives. Um, there are tax exemptions that they want to put for the importation of energy efficient medical equipment. So that goes towards our medical field. Um, there are tax exemption and subsidies that they want to do for the procurement of organic pesticides. Uh, then the, um, in relation to what I said for the five billion trees in, no, five billion trees in five years, um, they want to do the cost of seed, seed preparation, certification, nursery registration, tea planting on public land to be an allowable expense. Um, for the purpose of tax computation. Uh, so that, that I think should be done inter immediately because interesting enough, they have already given a tax incentive, a tax exemption for anyone who's setting up a carbon exchange in Kenya. But I kind of feel like that's putting the, the cart before the horse because you're, you're giving the tax exemption to the carbon exchange before we actually have a proper carbon like market in Kenya. So the incentive should go to the people who are doing the carbon capture, who are planting the trees for the natural uh, 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 carbon credits, uh, and then now we can talk about an incentive for our exchange. But at least now we're seeing it in the policy document, and they're putting it in the pipeline. Uh, so they have they want to impose a tax. This one is more like a, a, a tax, really, on uh, large scale fishing, putting quotas. So this is to uh, to encourage sustainable fishing practices. Uh, so people in that industry will be affected, and of course goes down the production line up to the, um, our hospitality industry uh, being affected. They wanna set water tariffs uh, to kind of provide the right incentives for sustainable water use. Again, as you can see, some things are adding tax to us and other things might be incentives to encourage the right behavior. But at the end of the day, it might just be additional uh, strain on, on, on businesses' pockets. So hence why I think it's very important for everyone to get involved in the conversation early so that we are kind of shaping how government is thinking about these incentives in the right way that's relevant for the Kenyan market, especially where we are. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna talk about su supply chain management. Um, and this is really about Kenyans as exporters. Uh, you'll find in other, in other jurisdictions, uh, this is becoming a big issue. So it's not just about my end product, but then I have to ensure that people within my supply chain who are contributing to my end product are also complying with certain ESG requirements, right? So um, for Kenyan companies to remain relevant, to remain um, competitive, we also have, even if it's not being regulated strictly here, there are some things that we will start having to comply with because it's required by the people who 
we are selling our products to. Um, and so this is something that private industry really needs to think about. Even if we're not regulated here, will you still be able to compete on a global scale if you're not actually sorting out your ESG risks in Kenya? Uh, and I wanted to end with this. So this is just a dramatic um, <laughs> headline. How ESG scores murdered the Ghana and Sedi. Um, and really there's been a lot of sensationalist and actually very inaccurate um, uh, headlines like this. Actually, even one was, was published in Kenya asking, why should Kenyans care about climate change risk? Um, again, we low carbon emission country, uh, we have big, bigger issues. Why should we care? Why should we be asked to comply with these things? Um, and so again, this, this, this particular article, I think, was oversimplifying a very complex problem. Ghana, Ghana's currency was affected then by more than ESG. ESG, I think, only came in when it, it comes to the ability to now get foreign funding to, to, to help them meet some of their goals, especially in relation to um, their exports like gold and, and, and cocoa, now that um, their currency has been affected. But it goes towards showing how some Africans are thinking about ESG being just another regulatory compliance, just another box to tick or another thing that is going to affect us. But in reality, um, if we want to stay competitive, this is something we have to comply with because our inve potential investors, potential financiers are looking at these issues. You can't escape them. So it's beyond, again, regulation. If you want to be able to access this funding, if you want to be able to get the right kind of investors coming in and looking at interested in your company, and then also um, uh, when for, for our funds um, uh, who are investing here, when they want to have good exits, basically have to ensure that their portfolio companies have met these requirements so that if additional debt or capital, or, or capital is coming in or someone is buying them out, then they're happy to do so because the company is really the kind of company they're looking for. So I think ESG is here. We cannot escape it. Um, Africans should comply, not just because it's a regulatory compliance, but because this is what's going to keep them um, going, the business is going for the next 10, 20 years, right? <laughs> Um, and I think that's where I'll stop for my overview and hand over to Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. Just a click, just enter. Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see so many of you so early. And um, thank you very much to our, our friends at Bowman's for inviting us to, to take part in this um, seminar. So um, uh, the reason Bowman's asked us to, to partner on this is that in the London and, and European market, in terms of the regulatory sphere here and the reporting requirements, I think we're only a little bit further ahead of, of East Africa, probably six to 12 months. But the trajectory of progress has been very, very swift. So the, the focus of, of our part of the presentation is, is going to be on sustainable finance and how sustainable financing products have developed. But certainly from our perspective in London, the sustainable financing market has developed incredibly quickly um, from a, a sort of standing start 18 months to two years ago, probably 80, 90% of the financing work we're doing for our local and our multinational clients is green, social or sustainability linked in some way. So we thought we'd spend some time talking about the characteristics of uh, the, those products, which are becoming uh, much more tightly defined as the market develops. Now, I think the catalyst for um, the development of the sustainable finance market has firstly been stakeholder pressure. So companies are being um, pushed from all sides, um, particularly we're seeing by shareholders um, to do the right thing, to be a good corporate citizen. And um, the social license to operate isn't a, a nice to have anymore. It's an essential to continue doing business and accessing finance. Um, and the other catalyst has been um, the introduction of regulatory requirements. So firstly, regulatory requirements of the sort that Christine has been talking about, which require you to do the right thing as a corporate but also 
to report to the world, so to say publicly and explain how you're doing the right thing. Reporting requirements are really um, the key to unlocking sustainable finance because they're throwing off the data that enables the financial system to provide these products um, in a way that, that, that maintains their um, integrity. So in the UK, oops, no, I've fallen at the first hurdle with the slides. What have I done? Is it the, is it the mouse that I'm clicking? Sorry, everybody. There we go. Okay. So um, in, in the UK, in terms of uh, reporting requirements, we've had the first round of TCFD climate disclosure reporting from our premium listed companies now. And for the first year, they were required to comply or explain. So the reporting requirements were not mandatory. And um, what we've seen um, at the end of the year are the results of that first year's reporting um, being interrogated, really. So the authorities have looked at it and told companies now very clearly what they need to do better um, in the next round of reporting, which is, I, I imagine, where the Nairobi Stock Exchange listed companies um, will be going over the next few months as, uh, as their first reports are analysed. And I think there are two key messages that have come out of that. One is um, the authorities want to see granular reporting. So the level of detail was, was criticised in a number of cases. And I think the other key theme that we've seen coming out is that in, in the world of sustainability reporting, companies are very focused on the positives, of course, want to say all of the good things that are being done and all of the progress is being made. But um, this kind of reporting needs to be balanced. So um, the authorities want equal emphasis on, on the risks. Um, and I think, you know, the data that, that is, is, is being collected as, as part of all of those reporting requirements, as I said, is what's feeding and, and fueling the sustainable finance market. So in terms of our agenda for today, I'm going to talk literally for one minute about the UK regulatory backdrop, just so you can see the, the, the volume of, um, of, uh, of legislation and regulation that, that's coming out and a little bit about um, reporting and, and, and data trends. Then we are going to talk about the different sustainable finance products because there are a range of products and they, they operate slightly differently. Um, and then we're going to spend most of our time doing a deep dive into the main characteristics of a sustainability linked loan. And the reason we're going to focus on that is that it's the product of widest application. Um, it isn't for companies that, that you know, invest in, in green projects. It is um, for, for any company. Sustainability linked loans can be used simply for working capital purposes. So um, that is, is the area that we've seen expand the most and, and possibly the area of widest interest. So looking at the, uh, the UK um, regulatory backdrop, this regime and standardised reporting are um, are really, really important. And um, they've enabled the parameters of the sustainable finance products that we've been working with to become um, a bit more defined because companies can offer banks this detailed and properly substantiated information. So I think it, looking at this in the same way as the quality of a company's financial reporting feeds into credit analysis for um, uh, debt finance purposes, the quality of a company's sustainability reporting um, feeds into um, sustainable finance and its availability. So um, in terms of what we've seen in the UK, we started off with listed companies, as I said, becoming subject to TCFD climate related disclosures. We've been through that year. The next step um, during 2023 is for those requirements on climate to be applied in a mandatory way to um, a wider universe of companies so that that's happening this year. Um, the, the, the next step um, after that is to, is to expand um, the environmental reporting regime beyond climate. So uh, the next piece that we're looking at are nature related disclosures and, and uh, disclosures in the biodiversity area. So that's moving along. And then of course, there are the international um, sustainability disclosure standards that are being prepared by the ISSB, which we know in the UK um, will be implemented. So in terms of, of, of reporting, there's a lot that's been happening. And then, of course, there's the piece that affects the 
financial sector, which are the developing regulatory requirements which uh, define how and um, when uh, a, a fund or an investor can um, classify their funds as, as, as green or sustainable. And of course, you know, the companies that, that access that finance will need to comply with those down the chain. And, you know, Christina has touched on this already, but I think the difficulty for companies that, that we're seeing is you're not just looking at the regulatory regime to which you're subject in your home country or in other countries that you operate. You've also got to think about the indirect impacts of other companies' um, legislation. So supply chain management um, is important, but the, the, um, the, the buzzword that, uh, that we're seeing sort of flow through all of this in Europe is, is value chain, not supply chain. So companies need to look up and they need to look down. And um, you know, just to give you a, a, an example of that, the EU is, uh, is developing um, a sustainability due diligence directive, which will apply across the EU to um, larger companies, uh, broad into companies that do business in the EU. But what that directive will require is um, for companies to diligence the compliance with sustainability and human rights standards of those in their value chain. Obviously, there are parameters around um, what's in scope, but you know what that sort of legislation, legislative approach does is, is draw companies overseas into compliance with the, the standards that, um, that are in place in the EU if they want to do business with EU counterparties. So a lot of these bits of regulation that are being developed at the moment really have extraterritorial arms and legs. And I think that is going to be a real headache. So the regulatory um, regime is, is consolidating and what we really hope is that as these regimes develop around the world, there is sufficient levels of, of coordination so that, you know, this challenge for companies at the moment of trying to comply with similar but, but different um, bits of legislation um, around the world um, is, is um, sort of evened, evened out. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. I think the, the other the, the big challenge at the moment for companies is to try and comply with all of this while the, the sort of the underlying environment is, is continually changing. We're very much in the design and um, build phase here. So developing um, an ESG strategy, um, which I, I think many of the companies in the room will already be quite advanced with, um, is a is a long term and is a, is a long term commitment and uh, uh, you know we've seen the teams within companies who are dealing with this area um, expand um, exponentially. I think one one particular trend we'd highlight is that you know many of our larger company clients have set up heads of um, have set up sustainability departments headed by um, C suite level um, heads of sustainability. But what we're also seeing now are separate roles created just to manage the reporting requirements. So heads of sustainability reporting who are tasked with dealing with all of these overlapping bits and pieces. So moving on to um, sustainable finance, which as I said, is the, the key focus of, of the presentation. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Robert to start us off and he's gonna start us off with the existential question of why do sustainable finance? Because you know, you've done all of this work, but you could still raise normal financing. So, Robert, do you want to explain why? Okay. How, do I, how do I head forwards and backwards? That, that one. one. That one. That one. Yeah. Wow. That's exciting. Um, not early anymore. I apologise for it being early. It's now late. <laughs> you need to get to your day jobs, and you're sitting here wondering. While you're having a load of lawyers tell you about sustainability and financing, you have a deluge of legislation coming at you. And you've got your day job. You've got companies that need to operate simply with the challenges of the supply chain, inflation, and your cost of living. And now you've added to that this whole question of sustainability. So the question is, are we just being forced to do it because it's another piece of annoyance? Or is it really, as Christina said, <coughs> I don't disagree with this, but is it really important? And one of the things we haven't talked about yet is apparently sustainable companies are long-term more profitable than other companies. 
We can debate that. If I was in a smaller room, we would debate it with fierce excitement. In a larger room, we debate it with silence. Feel, I feel the excitement. <laughs> the truth is, um, we are not seeing any deals in London on the financing side that do not involve a question of sustainability. Let me put that another way. Every single bank that walks into the room for our borrower clients is saying, you guys need to have sustainability. Why? Because our regulators, the banks, are telling us it's an incredibly important piece of the jigsaw for a bank to ensure that all the banks can do is deploy capital. And deploy capital, the question is, how do you do that? To whom? And is it the right thing to be doing? So banks are being mandated and being told you need to deploy capital to people who are doing the right thing, doing the sustainable thing, not even necessarily making good products. I have a client who's based in Iceland and they make prosthetic limbs. That's a really good thing. I think we could probably agree it's a really important and really good thing. But the requirements being put on them, and by the way, I'm not bank bashing here. I might be regulator bashing. I might be, but these are philosophical questions. We need to ask. The requirements being put on them by the banks is not just to be doing a great product, but for that product to be sourced in a great way. The raw materials to be the sale, the point of sale to be properly implemented. And the company is saying, look, we're really, really, really good at this. We're actually a leader in our area. The banks are saying to them, fine, but to get financing from us, and it's not just sustainable financing, but normal financing, you need to do even better. And my client is turning around and going, sorry, our competitors are a bit hopeless. By the way, everything I say in this room is confidential. <laughs> our competitors are a bit hopeless. And you're telling me that I need to be even better, otherwise I won't get, I won't even get through the door of financing. So the truth is sustainable financing is, is here to stay. It's not just green products. It's actually sustainability as a, a whole. So the initial hook, was price incentive. Initial hook was that you would get some sort of margin reduction. This is like a death trap. Um, it's fine. It's just if I go down, I'll get up again. Um, the initial hook was price incentives. But as we come on to, the truth is discounts for ESG are really thin. You could look at a, maybe 2.5 bips or 5 bips in sort of investment grade loans as being your, your actual discount or meeting a load of KPIs. And then you look at the other side of that and you say, well, I've got a load of reporting, I've got potentially ratings, I've got independent assessment, I've got limited assurance, I've got huge amounts of reputational risk if I get all of this wrong. And guys, you're giving me 2.5 bips. Really? Again, I'm just a lawyer, okay? Really important. Not a politician, <laughs> not a policy maker. Just a random lawyer, but I've been doing this for about 25 years. I know, I know I look good. Thank you. Um, and I've never seen in that 25 years the scale of change, the scale of regulation that we're seeing now. And it is a philosophical question whether it's the right thing to do. But you do have improved access to liquidity. Funds want to invest, banks want to invest in sustainable products. So you've got a price benefit, although it's thin, you've got liquidity as well, and you you're reinforcing the ESG goals by putting in place ESG financing. And you're embedding those goals into your financing package and your framework. And you're publicly saying that you are committed to ESG, but, but that's all great. That's all fantastic when you're meeting those goals, but a huge reputational risk if you're not. Why would you take on financing that puts in place KPIs on a yearly basis to meet certain sustainability goals when you just get 2.5 bits and the risk of not meeting them is being reported as being bad. Again, I am not judging, I'm just posing you the question. And my children will tell me that this is unacceptable for me to even raise that you might have a problem with these sustainability goals. But it is very important for companies to consider the actual benefits that are occurring as a result um, of this. So it's, it's a real challenge. It's a real challenge, but do you know what? I don't think we have a choice. 
I don't actually think we have a choice, given that every single transaction that we're doing at the moment in the London market and across Europe, uh, Europe, sorry, yes, Brexit, Europe, yes, <laughs> we still operate across Europe. Given every single deal we're doing across the world, including for cement makers or oil producers or whatever it might be, include a measure of sustainability. So that there really isn't a choice within that. And maybe that's just where we are. And maybe that's just um, like, we need to think about it because as businesses and as you come to actually in, implement this in terms of legislation, you have the ability to influence as well. And that's really, really important to get this regime um, right. My clicker isn't working, but there we go. I'm using the mouse, I'm being good. Look. I'm doing really well. I don't know what I'm doing. Oh there, there we go, okay. Before we go on much longer, I need we need to be really careful about a, a couple of elements here because the product categorization is very, very important. So there are green use of proceeds bonds, and that you, you all know this, but just a quick reminder. There are green use of proceeds bonds. That's where you take the money, you put it in a lockbox effectively, and you promise to use it for a green project. Interesting questions of what happens if you don't, where the money goes, is it segregated, all those fascinating questions. That's a green use of project bond. Promise to do this particular thing with it. Diligence the project, report on the project, et cetera, et cetera. And the eligibility and debt terms, they're shaped by the green bond principles and the green loan principles. Then moving on, there are social use of product loans. So proceeds applied to finance new or existing eligible social projects. And there you've got eligibility from the social bond principles and the social loan principles. Then you've got this third category, which we're really focused on because it's the most interesting category, because it's of general, as Catherine said, general applicability to many, many more businesses, where you've got sustainability linked loans. Use of proceeds, no one cares. Sorry, people care, but it's unrestricted. This is like working capital lines, it could be term loans, it could be RCFs, it could be whatever. And actually what people are saying is this isn't for a green purpose or a green project. This is just linked your business, the performance of your business, the financing of your business as a general concept will be linked to sustainability goals. And that's really powerful as a tool because you have KPIs and we'll talk about the KPIs and the SPTs and all that, all that stuff in a minute. But it's a really powerful tool. But you need to understand the differences between them. This is not green bonds we're talking about. This is not social bonds or green loans we're talking about. We're actually talking about where you've got a simple RCF that has embedded within it, a bit like embedding a margin ratchet for leverage, you embed within it KPIs that are around sustainability. I'm gonna hand over now, a less for a lot of mine. Careful. Yeah. Okay. Just, <laughs> right. If you die, we're gonna be fine. <laughs> if you die, we're gonna be fine. Yeah, we're gonna be fine. Excellent, I'm pleased to hear that. So um, Robert mentioned that the sustainable finance market and product terms are, are governed by these um, principles. Now, just to be clear, these principles have develop, been developed for global applications. So this isn't a UK or a US initiative. These principles have been developed by trade associations um, who, who, who operate in the, um, the global sphere. All of the principles are recommended voluntary guidelines. So this isn't something that has the force of regulation, but in practice, these parameters that are put in place by the principles are very closely adhered to because everybody is so concerned about the risk of um, greenwashing. So the principles are, are published separately for the loan market and the, the bond market. So the International Capital Markets Association publishes bond principles and the joint trade associations for the loan market publish the loan principles. So these, uh, the, the LMA for um, the UK, Europe and, and Africa, the LSTA for the US market and the, the APLMA in um, APAC. Now, as I said, these are voluntary recommended guidelines. And of course, in some jurisdictions over time, there may be a regulatory overlay. So some of you may have heard about the EU green bond um, standard which is in the works, which will regulate bonds that are labelled as green. Some of the, the reporting and um, disclosure requirements which corporates are being subjected to will be relevant because it's that material which um, financiers are drawing on to, to um, satisfy the principles. But the principles are the most important 
framework around these products at the moment. And they outline the core components that a financing transaction needs to feature if it's to be classified as green, as social, or as sustainability linked. And they're accompanied by a lot of guidance material that explains um, that intention and application. So I would say that you know, all of that stuff, which is on the trade associations websites, is really essential reading for anybody thinking about a sustainable finance product for the first time. Now, the loan and the bond principles um, are broadly the same. So the bond market was the trailblazer in um, this area. So ICMA put out the bond principles first, and then what the loan market did was sort of pick those up, print them to a very large extent with some adaptations around the edges to um, fit the, uh, the characteristics of the loan product. All of these principles have been updated since first publication to keep pace with the market. So, um, uh, you know, they move over time. They're very useful in providing parameters for these products, but their status as voluntary guidelines and, and sort of their high level style does mean that in some areas they're open to interpretation. It's worth being aware that the loan market principles are currently under review. And one of the reasons they're under review is that the bond principles have moved on and they need to be brought into line, but also to keep pace with how loan products have um, developed as the, the market has expanded. So in other words, policy requirements that individual banks have applied, which have developed the products are also in their way, driving how the principles move along. Not going well, is it? Yeah. on the keyboard, sorry everybody. That's good. There you go. There we go. I haven't got the right one up on my screen, so never mind. Okay, so um, sorry. So as um, as we covered, these principles provide a framework for the products, and they do that by describing the core components that these products um, need to feature. And there are four core components for the use of proceeds products, green and social loans and bonds. And there are five core components for sustainability linked products, which are the products which don't restrict the use of the financing proceeds, but uh, the terms of which are in some way linked to the borrower's sustainability objectives. So what data, what does a borrower need to do to um, access these products? So looking at the use of proceeds products first, the borrower needs an eligible project or um, a, a, a portfolio of eligible projects, so a portfolio of green or social product projects to which the proceeds of the loan or bond can be applied. And if you look at the principles, they contain an indicative list of categories of um, projects that could be categorised as um, green or social. But the eligibility of particular projects probably needs to be assessed in conjunction with external consultants or, or credit providers. Um, to, to make sure everybody's happy that the proceeds are truly being applied to something that in that relevant market people think is green or, or social. A process for evaluating eligible pro uh, projects needs to be in place within the borrower. So governance here is um, very important and finance providers need to be able to see how those projects fit into your overall sustainability strategy. As Robert touched on, the proceeds of these um, uh, green and social loans and bonds need to be segregated. That often means putting the proceeds in a separate account. That gives rise to questions of what you do with that money pending application to um, green or social projects that so we've seen corporate treasurers looking at green money market funds and, and thinking about how they can um, use that money while it's, it's set aside um, in, in an in a, a appropriate way. And then um, there also needs to be an appropriate reporting framework. So credit providers at the least should expect annual reports from the, the borrower or issuer covering the application of the proceeds of the green or social loan or bond um, and uh, the impacts that the, the relevant projects are having. So the question is sort of how you, you illustrate all of those features. So the key to all of this is data and, and reporting requirements, as we keep saying. And we'll come back to those in a moment and how they work in in practice. So 
Then turning to the, the other side of the slide, the sustainability um, linked products and what's required there in terms of data and information. Well, number one, there needs to be some KPIs, some key performance indicators. And these are elements of the borrower's sustainability strategy, it, the objectives that it wishes to achieve. So that might be a reduction in carbon emissions. In fact, it is in, in most cases. It may be um, an objective of achieving gender parity um, among its board or um, its uh, leadership. So, you know, there are different KPIs there and we'll talk about what we see, but that's the first piece that has to be in place. The next piece is that targets need to be set against which um, uh, achievement of those KPIs will be measured. And the really important thing about sustainable finance is that those targets need to be broken down into annual targets. So a company might have a, a carbon emissions um, target which uh, sets out its aims towards 2030 or 2050, um, but that needs to be broken down into what's going to happen in the next five years for the purposes of these sustainability linked financing products. The principles set out the characteristics that the loan bond needs to have. Um, and uh, at the moment, all they say is that the pricing needs to vary according to the borrower's performance against these sustainability targets. That will change, I think, in the next iteration, certainly of the loan principles, because the characteristics of these products are becoming better understood. And I think there is a drive to sort of um, make that clearer. In terms of reporting, again, annual reporting is required for sustainability linked products as for use of proceeds products, which covers the borrower's performance against the SPTs and the pricing impact under the loan or bond of um, that performance. And credit providers will want to see information that allows them to assess and, and monitor that. Which brings us on to the fifth component, which is verification or assurance. So how is that performance to be evidenced to the credit providers? And the direction of travel there is that credit providers want to see auditors or a third party consultant signing off on that. We're seeing less borrowers self certifying um, their own performance. So the core components are um, the same across the, the loan and bond principles for the use of proceeds products on one hand and the sustainability linked products on the other, which is deliberate because, of course, loans and bonds might be used to refinance each other. And, you know, we're also seeing um, conduit structures. So, for example, um, the IFCs and the DFIs are issuing green bonds have been very active, really been trailblazers in this area. And of course, those proceeds are being on lent to um, other uh, uh, borrowers who will be applying them for green or social purposes. And that might be by way of loan. So, um, you know, products are, are linked in, in that way. So there needs to be a level playing field. But there are some differences between loans and bonds here. Because, of course, bonds once issued are relatively difficult to amend as longer term instruments than loans. And the USP of the loan product is that it's flexible. Um, and so the terms are developed in conjunction with um, relationship banks. And the way this translates in practice to uh, these sustainable finance products is that the bond market is more reliant on these third party opinions and assurances that I talked about. So, in other words, the sustainability credentials are outsourced by bond investors more to um, third parties. Uh, so that, that's sort of where the checks and balances on the borrower are. And in the loan market, we've seen that work being done um, between the banks and uh, the borrower. So just looking at those um, issues in a, in a bit more detail. Now, the, 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 the term external review has become a bit of a, a term of art in this sphere. So when we talk about external review, you'll see that referenced in the, the principles. What we mean is some kind of review by a, um, a third party um, consultant to the effect that the borrower's sustainability credentials are as the borrower says they are. So. In the green and sustainable, sorry, in the, yes, in the green and the sustainable bond market, um, so for the use of proceeds products and the sustainability linked products, a second party opinion is customary at the outset of the transaction. So typically the borrower or issuer commissions an ESG consultant to say 
that the transaction that's been put together is aligned with the principles. So you've got a tick that you, you've um, you've uh, you've met the core components. In the loan market, pre, uh, second party opinions pre-signing are a bit less common. But what we're seeing happen now is that for issuers that access the capital markets and loans, they're applying the same standards across um, the piece. In both loan and bond transactions, we're seeing borrowers and issuers being required to obtain a third party assurance, normally from their auditors, on um, the uh, uh, in the use of proceeds products on the tracking of the proceeds of the, uh, the loan or bond and in the sustainability linked market, uh, an assurance on the borrower's performance against its sustainability performance targets. So even though it is acknowledged in the loan principles that self-certification by the borrower is okay there, the direction of travel that, that we're seeing is very much that the auditors have to be um, involved. And you know, these underlying regulatory requirements that are developing in some areas will force that issue and, um, and make an external review compulsory. And um, in conjunction with that concept of external review, um, I don't know whether any of you have yet seen a sustainable finance framework. Again, this is a this is a, another um, term of art. So uh, the concept of a sustainable finance framework, which is basically a, a public piece of paper that explains your sustainability strategy and how you're applying that to your sustainable financing. This concept originated in the bond market, and it's where um, they're, they're most commonly used. But as I said, increasingly, borrowers who use loans and bonds are creating frameworks that cover both. And what a framework does is lays the ground for future sustainable debt issuance. So um, these documents uh, describe the borrower's sustainability um, goals and the ESG projects that it plans to uh, uh, finance and how they've been selected and how they're going to be benchmarked. Um, it confirms that the goals are aligned with the relevant principles, and that's where the second party opinion comes in. So people will get a second party opinion on the framework, and um, that will be set in the context of the borrowers or issuers broader sustainability um, strategy. And there isn't any standardized or prescribed format for these um, frameworks, um, and they're not part of the legal documentation of the debt product, but one thing I would say is that it's quite important as you develop these frameworks, if you plan to use one, to share them with your legal advisors um, uh, as you're preparing them, because they're sort of a plug in to the sustainable finance products. And if they're not set up correctly, then that can be difficult when you come to do the financing. And I you know, won't go through these now, but what I've put up on the slide are, are just some examples of sustainable financing frameworks, because I think with these they're quite hard to explain in the abstract and if you have a look at a couple of them you can see what they do and I've also put some links to some um, external review reports and some forms of um, assurance uh, uh, which illustrate what we've been talking about. So in terms of product governance and, and the principles just to sum up on the three key points about the direction of travel number one is that there is increasing emphasis on transparency that means external reviews, it means public frameworks which sit alongside sustainability um, reports which illustrate um, how uh, the, the issue of borrowers put together its green credential, uh, credentials or sustainability credentials. The second theme is um, a desire for the principles to take a more directional approach to the terms of these products and I think as the, the principles develop we'll see them saying a lot more about the individual clauses that the, the legal documentation needs to um, specify. And then um, the third point is, um, the third point is that where external reviews and third parties are involved, I think the principles become, will become more directional about what those third party reviews need to look like and who provides them. So, for example, um, the amendments that uh, are being worked on um, on the loan principles at the moment, you know, are going into quite quite a lot of detail about the professional standards that the assurance providers need to comply with in order to be acceptable for the purposes of this product. And you know, the way that's going probably limits 
uh, the ability to, to provide these assurances to um, the auditors. So um, that is uh, something that we will see develop. Now, I wanted to just um, say a very quick word on sustainable project finance, because um, I know there's interest in that area in this, this audience. And I just wanted to flag up a point that's come up in discussions. Project financing can be green, it can be social, it can be sustainability linked. So any financing can be created within the parameters of these, um, these products. Um, but you know, if you've got IFC or, or other DFI um, involvement in the project and um, the project is within the scope of the equator principles, you know, those cover some of the similar territory or some, some territory which crosses over a bit with, um, with the, the, the requirements of the, the principles. But the point I really wanted to flag is that each of those requirements still needs to be considered separately. So the performance standards that might apply to any project which touch on environmental and uh, social impact don't necessarily mean that the, um, the principles are, are complied with. So we've got a, another layer of um, issues to be thought through here. So sustainability linked loans, this is the last piece of our, our presentation and we're, we're just gonna have a look at the, the key features of, of the product um, and um, how you put one together. Don't worry, we're coming into land. You have day jobs, I know, but you know, this is much, much more interesting, even more gripping than the day job. Um, really important to look at these sustainability uh, linked uh, loans. The key point is pricing, and come, we've come back to that over and over again. There are KPIs, key performance indicators, and they're assessed against your predetermined sustainability performance target, so FPT. It's a whole world where an acronym is just running out of, <laughs> out of control and unacceptable. Now, your KPIs may relate to E, they may relate to S, they may relate to G. And that's an important point because we'll come back to that later. But it's the KPIs and the SPT, so key performance indicators and the sustainability performance targets, where all the work is done. Don't let lawyers tell you, and I'll put them out of a job here, don't let lawyers tell you the drafting is particularly complicated. What's really, really key is that your corporate side on sustainability and your financing side on, I desperately want a sustainable loan, actually talk to each other? Because you will have corporate loans that, as Catherine said, go out to 2030, 2050. What's required in sustainable financing is translating that into KPIs that are annual. But if your treasury team don't talk to your sustainability team, that equals embarrassing. That's where we're seeing the real work, the real work in advance of talking to the bank. The banks are incredibly helpful in the UK market and in Europe of talking about what would be appropriate KPIs and what would be appropriate SPTs and what similar companies are being seen to do. But they're very, very bad, not bank fashion, but they're very, very bad at looking at the individual business. They love comparing businesses and saying, well, these guys have just done this. You must be able to put this social goal in. Being with a borrower who goes, no, I can't. I don't have the reporting, I don't have the focus, I don't have the ability, and I don't have the desire to do that particular KPI, at which point the bank says that's unacceptable, you need to do what your peers are doing. Is that the right thing? Or actually do we need to take the KPIs and the SPTs that are relevant for that business? Currently the LMA is working on some standardised wording. The wording has come out, we have the privilege, because we advise corporate treasurers and the Association of Corporate Treasurers, we have the privilege of reading that draft before it comes out. And we have some very significant comments on it. We're hoping that those will be reflected. We're hoping that the drafting will be amended, but currently there is no LMA drafting. It's not a plug-in that just goes, hey, just use the LMA. And even when the LMA drafting comes out, please, 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 to a bank in the room, don't say this is standard, this is LMA, therefore we just implement it. And if you're a borrower, can negotiate it because it is not a settled framework in any um, way. The APLMA um, term sheet's been published and the LST has drafting guidance for SLLs as well. But the key point is when, when we do have more standardised mechanics, they will be blank in terms of the most important bit, which is your company's KPIs, your company's SPTs. And that has to be looked at on a case by case basis. So the first questions to consider, what actually should be your KPIs? 
This is where rubber hits road, although we're not allowed to talk about rubber because that's significant emissions. <laughs> That was actually quite funny. <laughs> I know you guys didn't think it was, but I thought it was. By the way, um, this morning I saved significant amounts of water because there was no hot water in the hotel. So I sustainably showered, <laughs> just in case you wanted. Well, I told you that, but I thought I'd just share. Um, what is relevant core and material for the actual business of the borough? And you do look at peers, you do look at industry standards, and you do look at illustrative um, registries. But the question then is, that KPI that you're putting in place has to be measurable or quantifiable. And you're not looking at just one KPI. The market more and more is thinking that sustainability link lane would have about two, three, maybe four KPIs in place. And there's a possibility of adding further in the future. We'll talk about what happens if actually your KPI doesn't work anymore and you need to amend it. And is it E, is it S, is it D? I think mean, in this market, we started looking at environmental KPIs, people looking at phase one, uh, uh, scope one, scope two emissions. What's happening now more in the European market is scope three. They're looking at throughout the value chain, as Christina was talking about. What actually is happening is your product comes through the value chain. How are your suppliers implementing sustainability? What is going on? And the key point there is reporting. You might commit to a scope three KPI but you're actually committing your suppliers to do something or to act in a certain way, and you're incapable of checking it. You're incapable of reporting on it. This is a much wider issue than just agreeing a random KPI in a sustainability linked financing. This goes to the heart of the value chain. And if you're not ready to put that scope three standard in place, then don't put it in place. So that sounds very patronizing. I didn't quite mean it like that. There's a lot of pressure here. We've seen more and more borrowers say, do you know what? I'm not quite ready. I'm not quite ready to go public on a scope three. I'm not quite ready to go public on a KPI. And the truth is, I will be ready, but I need to think about it very, very carefully. We need to sort of look at the external factors that might actually impact how you can monitor and report on that KPI. Social KPI. We've seen a large number of borrowers implement social KPIs generally around gender. Generally around gender that is measurable, i.e. C-suite or senior management. The aims and targets to move to say 30% representation of, of, of females within the C-suite, or 40% in the next year, or 50% in the next year. And remember, by the way, these targets have to be ambitious. They have to be measurable. And once you've got to 50% gender equality in the C-suite, What's the next KPI you put in place on that? You go to 60? You go to 70? Nobody's actually really thinking about what happens. I mean, that would be absolute nirvana when we get to that point of gender parity. The next question will then be what further social goals would one put in place? It could be health and safety goals, it could be other social goals as well. And in terms of setting your KPIs, it's about that ambitious target. There needs to be a material improvement year on year in the target that you set. That's, that can be tricky. The banks will say she would be more ambitious. We want to be able to say that we are supporting and financing the most ambitious, sustainable companies in the world. And actually, you will be saying, look, our target is to get to zero emissions by 2030, 2040. But translating that into annual target, where that movement may be lumpy, the movement may not be a smooth and beautiful trajectory. It's something that has to be really thought about when you're putting in place annual targets. There may be significant lead times and it's got to remain ambitious throughout the tenor of the loan. So you could have loans for five years, you could have loans for eight years, you could have loans for 10 years. How do you actually put in KPIs that are ambitious throughout? And how do you frame it? I'm answering no questions here, I'm just posing questions. We see these KPIs all the time, and I can, we can talk about it later what we're actually seeing. But is it an absolute value? Is it a percentage against the baseline? Quite often, people are saying, my, my baseline is CO2 emissions in my business three years ago. And against that best baseline, I will improve year on year by 12%. Is it a change? Is it a range that you will move to? And what's the benchmark really against? Because that is, that is the absolute key. Businesses are setting these benchmarks in the context of their own business. Yes, in the context of principles, yes, in the context of the market, but actually in the context of their own business. 
one thing I would say, we are seeing, as, as, as Catherine said, the rise of sustainability directors, sustainability reporting leads, etc. But what we're also seeing is embedded in every board and every decision that they take, question of sustainability. A lot of people are arguing that if you give sustainability responsibility to just an individual on the board or to a committee, the board forgets about it. Because it's been given over to a committee, the committee reports every quarter or so on improvements and progress. Maybe, just maybe, actually what should be happening is that every single decision has embedded in it a moment where you say, this is a key decision. Is this actually within our sustainability goal? As a firm, we've done that. We're law firms actually doing this as well. We have science-based targets in place number one, and we have every single board or partnership board decision has a sustainability check. Is a board, which is to say, and by the way, have we? We don't even have any findings in place on a sustainable basis. The key here is measurability. The key here is fundamental appropriateness for the business, and that links into the question of whether you actually have to set these on day one at all. Thank you. So. As Robert's been saying, the um, the science and thinking behind these KPIs and SPTs as they're set is moving at a great pace. And also the borrower's own circumstances change over time. So what we're seeing is these sustainable finance products being created in a way or structured in a way that allows those KPIs and SPTs to adapt and to be dynamic. And um, in the bond market, a lot of reliance um, is being placed on, on frameworks and external reviews to permit that flexibility to avoid the need for bondholder consent if the KPIs and SPTs need to change. So the bond T's and C's will contain some parameters around um, permitted adjustments. But in essence, the borrower has flexibility provided an external reviewer will sign off to adjust the, um, the KPIs and SPTs Sorry, the KPIs and SPTs as they um, go um, along. And in the loan market, in contrast, lenders are typically looking for a bit more control over the borrower's ability to adjust the KPIs and SPTs over time. Now, from a bank perspective, the preference is always that the KPIs and SPTs are set in day one. In other words, um, for the loan to be a sustainability linked loan and to be publicised as a sustainability linked loan, the borrower needs to have these KPIs and SPTs. However, acknowledging the, the, the pace of, of, of growth and progress in this area, we have seen some loans structured as sleeping sustainability linked loans. So in other words, the mechanics for um, a sustainability linked loan agreement, the, the margin adjustment mechanisms and reporting mechanisms and so on. But the important bit, the KPIs and SPTs are left blank to be added um, at a, a, a later date. And, you know, I, I think generally banks aren't keen on those structures, but equally, you know, they can be a practical option for a borrower who is quite advanced in its sustainability journey, but isn't quite ready at the point it needs to refinance to put those targets in place, but it may be in a year's time. And, and you've sort of pre-agreed um, the, uh, the structure. Um, in addition to um, these sleeping structures, um, we've also seen loans where a certain number of KPIs and SPTs are put in place on day one, but the loan makes provision for that universe to be expanded, um, expanded over time. So I put three examples on the slide of situations that we've seen um, recently. So the first one was a borrower who had two KPIs ready on the day it wanted to refinance wasn't quite ready with a third. Some banks in the syndicate had a policy of three KPIs being required, which is, as we've already said, something we're seeing increasingly often. So we had a mechanism for putting in the third KPI within um, a year and uh, um, a, a process for doing that. The second example was a borrower who is in the aluminium sector. And um, in that sector, science-based targets, so ETI certification 
um, isn't yet available or wasn't available at that time for scope three um, emissions. So in that instance, we had an undertaking to create uh, targets around um, scope three emissions for that borrower um, when those targets became available. Um, a third example um, was a, a, a borrower with a, a KPI around gender balance in its leadership um, positions. And what the borrower said to the banks is, look, you know, this is a five year facility. I have visibility on my pipeline of women who are going to be promoted into these positions over the next three years. But, you know, beyond that, I don't really know now what, what I'm going to have or what I'm going to be able to do. And I don't want to set myself up to fail. So what we did was build in a mechanism that allowed the uh, sustainability performance targets against that KPI to be revisited at um, a later date. Um, so that sort of adjustments in the sense of what you do if the KPI or SPT um, targets aren't quite ready. There's another angle to adjustments in these facilities and that's what happens if during the life of the, the loan the lenders or the borrower feel that those um, targets have become inappropriate for some reason and think they should change. And so in most of the sustainability linked loans we're seeing now, and that's been a change that's happened over the last sort of six to 12 months, we're seeing a clause which is being referred to as a rendezvous clause. Um, and that is just a provision which sets out the circumstances in which the KPIs and SPTs will be reopened and a process for how those changes will work. I would say there's very limited consistency as far as we can see in the wording of those clauses in terms of who invokes them, whether it's the lender or the borrower or indeed both, and um, particularly the, um, the triggers for um, the reopening of those targets. So, for example, borrowers might want the right to um, propose amendments if there's a change in the business. So, you know, if, if you do a, a, an acquisition of a, a particularly carbon intensive business, that might affect your um, emissions targets and they might need to be adjusted. A theme that's come up more recently is what happens if the changes in the economic backdrop and in trading conditions have an impact on how quickly borrowers are able to achieve their SPTs. So, um, you know, one example there, we had a client who um, distributed its, its products um, predominantly by um, electric vehicle and by train, but pressures on, on the, the supply chain meant that the only way that it could continue to fulfill its obligations economically was to switch to air freight, which of course busted its carbon emissions target significantly. So, you know, there is, there is a balance between those sorts of economics factors and, and uh, wanting the company to continue in business and um, what these um, SPTs look like. Um, another reason why borrowers might need to revisit uh, the targets is if uh, there is a change that makes them impossible to report or comply with. Um, and lenders are very keen to see a right to reopen KPIs and SPTs if they feel they are no longer ambitious. And that's something that borrowers worry about quite a lot. So if they overperform in year one, does that mean that the lenders will say, OK, you've done better than you said you would. We're going to redo all of this. So, you know, that can be a bit, bit tricky for, for borrowers to um, manage. And, you know, it needs to be framed in terms of what borrowers are practically able to do. Um, these sorts of questions can, as in the bond market, be outsourced to um, an external reviewer, of course, if there's a debate about how KPIs and SPTs should change. But that is at um, an additional cost. And Robert mentioned the LMA sustainability linked loan rider that's in the course of being produced. Um, I think this is one of the more difficult provisions that the LMA is going to be addressing in that rider. And my instinct is that where we'll end up when we see the drafting is that they'll cast the range of triggers as widely as they can to cater um, for all of the different parties who fed in views. And so, you know, that is going to be a really good example of a provision where you're not going to be able to lift it out of the rider and say, this is the LMA. You're going to need to think through each trigger in turn to see if it's appropriate in the context of the deal. Um, so final point for me is on, on um, reporting requirements. Sustainability linked loans provide for annual reporting, and that typically requires three components from the borrower's point of view. So there'll be a sustainability compliance certificate, which you know, looks like the sort of certificate that you would deliver 
um, to illustrate compliance with financial covenants, for example. Um, and that was set out whether the borrowers met the SPTs and what the margin adjustment is as a result. Um, and that's normally required to be accompanied by information that illustrates the borrower's progress. And that may be its public sustainability report. So typically these reporting uh, requirements are set to align with the borrower's sustainability reporting um, uh, framework. And finally, there will need to be an assurance by an external reviewer, as I said, normally the um, auditors, as to whether or not the borrower has indeed met its um, targets. So I think with that, we should move on to the important bit, the pricing. And it's all about pricing. The incentivization here, is to get a margin reduction if your SPTs are met, uh, and conversely, a margin uplift if you don't meet them. And look, this is not, and it's really important, this is not about the banks being able to call an event of default. It's very, very important that that drafting point, and it will be in the LMA guidelines, but overall in the documents, there should be no suggestion that a failure to meet these KPIs is an event of default. It is simply a margin adjustment. Piece. If it became an event of default, nobody would be doing it because it would be a complete disaster. You couldn't have time to remedy, et cetera, et cetera. But how much should the margin adjustment be? And that, that's really relevant or, or related and correlated to the relevant market that you're in. So I talked about investment grade loans in the UK or in Europe across the US as well, the adjustment being sort of 2.5, 2.5 bits. Not a huge amount when you're looking at employing a sustainability coordinator, reporting various other requirements as well. And people shake their head in dismay that that's not more generous. On leverage loans, it can be larger. It can be more like the sort of double, triple that. But it is correlated against the product that you are going into. And then the question is in terms of, of, of how it operates, both in terms of the amount, how it's structured, whether there's more than one SPI, and who receives the benefit of the discount or the premium. So the common thread is that these margin adjustments are, are not typically cumulative. So in a certain year, you've got your standard margin. If you meet your KPIs, and we'll talk in a minute about how many, you will get the margin reduction, but just for that year. The next year, when you meet the KPIs again, you don't start from that reduced margin and get a further reduction. Go back to your original margin and get a reduction from that original margin. Is that logical? I have argued long and hard with my colleagues it's not. My colleagues tell me it's perfectly logical. I, I don't think it is, but there we go. You can have the argument with the banks um, about it. And the reason they do it like that is because otherwise it erodes price very, very significantly is the bank. In terms of how it's structured, well, before we do that, let's talk about where it goes. It's a really interesting question, and one we've been on behalf of borrowers, and we do act for a lot of banks as well. When we act for banks, we defend the bank position, I promise you. But we act for a lot of borrowers, and in terms of the borrowers, the borrowers are saying, okay, if I meet my KPIs, I get a margin reduction. If I don't meet my KPIs, I get a margin uplift. Where does the margin uplift go? Is it right that the margin uplift goes back to the banks and improves profits or whatever it might be of the banks? Really interesting question. The answer from many borrowers is, if this is all about sustainability, actually the margin uplift, my penalty for not meeting my KPIs, should actually go into a green project somewhere. Should be ring fence to make sure that I do green things, or actually simply should go to a charity that does green and sustainable projects. Because that's the logic. Should it actually go back to increase the bank's profits? I don't think so. Now, that's a point that we have won, let's say, one in inverted commas, for borrowers in a limited number of loans. So I don't want you to hear coming out of here that it's always the case that the uplift goes to charity. And the immense arguments we've had with the banks about which charity it goes to, why the charity exists, what KYC they need to do on the charity, all the other challenging things that would be looked at. But there is a logicality here, which is quite important. In terms of how it's structured, um, if there's more than one KPI, there's an increasingly prevalent view 
that which is likely to be reflected in the updated drafting that if fewer than the full set are met there's a neutral level what do i mean by that you've got three kpis if you meet only one of them you don't get a margin adjustment you don't get a congratulation it's only if all three of them are met or maybe two of them are met you might get that adjustment we'll see in a, a slide in a minute how that works and when does that margin adjustment take effect and um, Catherine mentioned that you deliver a sustainability certificate effectively like a financial covenant certificate and the margin adjustment for that year will take effect from when you deliver that certificate so logically speaking if you've met your kpis you want to get that certificate out quickly in the year if you haven't met your kpis maybe you'll use the full period that you're allowed to in order to delay getting your certificate out. So think about the period in which you need to deliver that certificate uh, as well. Give some practical examples on this side of how it might work. So these are recent examples, and, and, and this shows that there's really no standardization in the market. So example number one, you've got three KPIs, and where you um, don't meet any of them, you get an additional 75 bips, question mark who it goes to, but we talked about that already. And this is the classic structure one would, have, one would have expected originally. Meet one KPI, you get 25 down, two KPIs, another 25, uh, sorry, still the 25 normally. So it's, but for one or two, you just get a 25 bips um, uh, discount. And if you meet all three KPIs, you get a 75 bips discount. The second one is is beginning to be more sort of prevalent, which would be um, even if you meet one KPI, you get no discount at all. If you meet two, you get some. And if you meet three, you get even more. And then the third example, which I can't see because my neck is hurting me, is where you um, effectively look at all the KPIs having to be met in order to get the adjustment. Now, it's really annoying. It's really annoying that I can't come here and say to you what the market standard is. Because at the moment, this is a developing area. You, this morning, may not believe it, but you're at the forefront of exciting developing areas. I mean, there's some degree of joy in the room at that prospect. <laughs> and that means that the really exciting part of that is means you can shape that market. So actually looking at these, you need to work out what the right thing is for a borrower, for a lender, in order to implement that. And it's incredibly important to look at that. Yeah, and, and one thing I think that's worth saying about the pricing of these loans is that the pricing that we've illustrated here is the pricing that is typical or, or that might be seen in the London originated loan market. And obviously these price adjustments need to be set at a level that is relative to regional and margin norms. So, you know, a, a highly rated investment grade um, corporate in the, in the London market might only be paying 20 or 30 bips overall for its financing. So a, an adjustment of two and a half bips is, is relative to that. In a, in a leverage loan where we're, we're sort of seeing pricing at about 300 bits, somewhere between 7.5 to 15 bits might be the adjustment. And I know that as the market's been developing in South Africa, I'm told by colleagues there, that about 15 bits, I think, is the, is the norm in the South African market relative to, to regional margins. So I think, you know, in, in terms of, 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 of the banks, what is appropriate for the relevant market needs to be considered rather than necessarily what's being done um, around the world on this. So finally, a, a word on anti-greenwashing um, provisions. We've talked a lot about how you make these products um, sustainability linked, how you create a sustainability linked loan. Um, the flip side of that is that banks are very keen to make sure that if the borrower does something which prejudices the sustainability linked status of that loan, its status as such falls away. And um, this is what we, we, we've seen called a, a declassification provision. So, um, uh, and there can be a, a number of triggers for declassification. This is another area where there's not, there's not too much consistency in drafting and we'll see thinking develop a bit as we get the LMA drafting, but things like a persistent breach of reporting requirements. So a persistent inability to meet SPTs can lead to a process where the loan is um, declassified and that will be protected by, by provisions which restrict anybody from uh, referring to the loan after that as a sustainability linked loan. So I think that's an area where banks are really focused at the moment. A related point 
is um, what happens if the borrower is in compliance with its SPTs under the loan, but something else has happened in the business, which calls into question its sustainability credentials overall. So, for example, the borrower might have met its KPIs in terms of emissions targets and have got its margin adjustment on that basis, but it's just been on the front page of the newspaper that it's using child labour in Bangladesh to make its products. Um, you know, that sort of ESG controversy, banks think rightly, should prejudice the status of the loan. So those sorts of clauses are quite hard to, to craft. You know, how do you define an ESG controversy? So um, those often require a bit of um, discussion. And then our final slide is about sustainability coordinators, more external parties. It's almost ending. You can have coffee. It's almost going to be over. I promise you. Um, just a quick word on sustainability coordinators. So in common with, um, I have to be really careful how I put this, in common with everything else in the world, where you get something new, people jump on the bandwagon of newness and want to carve out roles for themselves. And there's no criticism of that, that's just reality. And in a syndicated loan, um, a bank or a number of banks will often come to you and say, actually, do you know what? We should be the sustainability coordinator. And the role generally there is to help in the crafting of the KPIs, to give some comparison across, to talk about what they're seeing in the market, help with the negotiation of those KPIs and, and SPTs, look at the drafting in advance together with legal advisors. We love legal advisors. Get your legal advisors involved early. They're lovely people um, and really, really important. And the sustainability coordinator role will then be designed to smooth the path of those agreed KPIs and SPTs and all the drafting through with the syndicate of banks. And that, that is the role done well is absolutely important and absolutely essential. So I was working on a syndicated deal recently where we had about 60 banks. And in order to be able to smooth through all the banks accepting the KPIs, the SPTs, almost having a bank that would put their name to the sustainability, we've looked at it, we've diligenced it, we've thought about it, smoothed through that path. And it is an area, of course, where league tables are important. And banks love league ta tables, and rightly so. And being the sustainability coordinator, banks are fighting over that role. I've never seen such excitement in my life as to be a sustainability coordinator. Which leads to an interesting fee question. So in the European market, and I'm not saying it should be the same across anywhere else, in the European market, these roles are often done for very, very low, either no fees or very, very low fees. And the reason for that is because actually it's seen as part of the overall MLA, a ranger type role. And because banks are growing their practice and want to be seen as leaders in this area. However, I do think that as time goes on, and more and more people, if every loan is having sustainability within it, that coordinator role and knowledge will be squeezed. And I think banks will begin to charge for that role. So I've seen some banks saying, look, it's a, a role that's important. We think that a £30,000, £40,000, £50,000 fee in relation to this is reasonable. And it's very interesting, the last point really is, what does that sustainability coordinator do in the future? So they've helped you design They've helped you make sure the SPTs and, and KPIs are in play. They've helped you negotiate with the banking group. But in the future, they not, may not post signing of the loan. There may not actually be a, a role. And that's a question. If you want to declassify some of the KPIs, you might bring back in your sustainability coordinator in order to give them a role, to help them have a role within that. But that post signing role, they may play a similar uh, role in coordination, but they may not. And then the last point, which is probably the least interesting point, but there we go. We're seeing an increasing desire from sustainability coordinators to be involved in the press releases and the comms around your loan, around a borrower's loan, which is odd, really odd. That level of involvement and intrusiveness in the press releases is quite surprising. So previously for sort of arrangers, et cetera, all it is is that you, when you communicate, you need to mention the arranger's name. There's not a level of intrusiveness. With sustainability coordinator terms, we're seeing much more consent rights around what the borrower is actually putting out around the sustainability issues. Again, that can be negotiated out as well.
So when, I, when I'm about to say we've done a whistle-stop tour through sustainability link loans and sustainability bonds, you will disagree because you've been sitting here for quite a long time. But this is a very complicated subject, which fundamentally comes down to setting proper KPIs, getting good sustainability performance targets, not being over ambitious, but being ambitious enough, getting the margin adjustments, but living in this tightrope of real challenge around the publicity. Because this isn't so much about margin. This is more about direction of travel and about the risk when you do not meet these KPIs and SPTs, that in fact the publicity that comes with that and the reputational risk that comes with that is extremely significant. It's been a huge pleasure. I, I hope you share that pleasure. <laughs> totally sure whether you do, We're working on it. Um, we are going to leave you in peace, but we will leave time for Q&A, but I will hand back over to Christina. So thank you very, very much. And yes, it's been a pleasure, Robert. Um, so yeah, uh, we want to open up to uh, Q&A. Uh, so I think all three of us will be available to answer questions and I also have some colleagues in the room in case anything um, is there for us to throw to them. So um, anyone with a question? From any element of the presentation? <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to get a bit of a question. I'm going to ask you about two. 
And just to add to that, interestingly enough, the draft policy document I told you about, government has put in incentivizing the use of hybrid vehicles. And so that's why I say look at the policy, make comments, because they also need to be relevant to the Kenyan market. Um, what do, if they're putting in the incentives, what will they look like? Um, what are our views on it? Just in case they'll put something in that just does not make sense for the Kenyan market. <laughs> There's also a place to change, but I think we're looking at the moment for the Green Finance Institute, which is a government body, great um, government body, at buses and coaches. The buses and coaches are lagging behind in, electric, in electrification. And you can do it, but the pace of change is moving so quickly that the technology will develop very, very, very quickly. So the problem there is that when you finance these buses now, you finance them with the idea that there will be a sort of residual value. When you get to the end of it. And what we're hearing from Pinocchio is an electric bus or coach that's now, in five, six years' time, because the technology will have been changed, will have almost no residual value. I don't believe that because I think you can swap batteries out and things like that. But actually, if that's the case, then how on earth are we going to finance buses, coaches now to be electric? We're meeting, we're doing round table pressing to discuss that. This is much wider than financial. Any other questions? Yeah. I just received a question for the candidate. A lot of different subjects. <laughs> Direction to go because obviously, you know, there are some very easy KPIs that are going to so gender representation is uh, takes you a very short time to figure it out. But obviously, you need to like still have your targets. And you to... But do you see the trend that we have in our KPIs and also in terms of the standardization? Because I see that it's in March, and now that we have investors on the different KPI requirements. We already see a trend. I think. Uh, but I think there's a difference between sort of reporting expectations, listed companies, or, or reporting of financial annual reports versus this kind of stuff, which is where you get a margin change. But if the margin change is going to be limited to sort of the three to five KPIs, and actually to try and manage it and manage the sort of the impact of those in a loan document has to be sort of focused, has to be focused on. There's absolutely no question, though, that in reporting and financial statements and expectations from investors, you're going to see many, many more, uh, maybe not KPIs as such, but I, I, maybe, not, maybe not KPIs that have an effect, but ones where there's an expectation to report on. By the way, on the gender point, um, you can only report on gender if people identify the gender. So one of the the challenges we're having in the London market, for example, is a number of people are not prepared to report their, their gender. And so the reason some of those KPIs are limited to C-suite or senior management is because you can actually get some data on it. So be, be careful when you put a KPI in and say, you know, 20% of my um, my workforce, or 30% next year, 40% of the year after, will be female. We, we can't actually measure that. So that's just a graphic side. I should have mentioned this isn't an advertising purpose, but I should have mentioned somewhat of our credentials. So we've done about 40 of these in the last six months. 
just the last six months ago, for a variety of borrowers and banks. So we're we're seeing quite a lot of the market. And I think in terms of the Banks have done a lot of loans. It's that the annual trajectory of carbonization is harder, and it's now just been quite far off on the stick. So banks have looked at the benchmarking conscious now, but we all know it's Sorry, any last questions? Oh, sorry, actually, two, <laughs> two questions. Um, Sorry, can, you, can I give you the mic? Yeah. <laughs> and then you know, we don't think they are affected by it. I just find out if um, there's any plan as to uh, any NSC visit company that are affected by the regulation. By the EU regulation. The scope of, um, well, basically, the EU regulation is. Very difficult to explain shortly. There are turnover thresholds, there are employee thresholds, there are geographic thresholds, which relate not only to incorporation but to um, a place of business and volume of business within the EU. So, um, in terms of whether NSE listed companies have been analysed to see if they're, they're in scope, I don't know the answer to that, but those which have European operations will be business to European counterparts probably be touched in some way, if not now, but in the future as the EU legislation develops, because the uh, EU reporting standards and the EDG diligence directive are being finalised now, but there's going to be quite a long road to implementation for people other than so people. Okay? So it will probably be sort of 25, 26 before we, we can see this coming into force. But I think what we'll see this year is clarity on the scope map. So that companies can start to um, analyse in more detail when they're affected and, and how they might be. Yes. And Trisha? Um, thank you. So my question or discussion point is around the point you mentioned around ESG linked loans and the failure to meet that would be more not only just the fault, but more maybe an adjustment from pricing. So my experience has been there are certain financial or our partners have to make this an event of default, so they sort of tier them. Um, so meaning some that are so uh, substantial, like perhaps child labor, they are able to keep you on as a borrower because also where they get their financing from and their requirements. Just want okay. to find out, yeah. So I think some maybe reducing paper waste, you can say fine, that's a you know, we can talk about it, but some for them are so crucial to their purpose that it actually is all in the realm of an organization. Um, it, it's not the experience we're having thus far, and I think um, I'm going to be slightly controversial again. Um, I think well-advised borrowers would probably say there's a compliance in, with law undertaking that I have in my document, and if I don't comply with law, relevant law, I have an event to I get that. Underneath that, there's all sorts of disposal requirements, you know, negative pledges, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But if we're going to start cherry picking certain things, and then medical sorry, just to add to that, there's obviously sanction, sanctions and that's a money thing. If we begin, and I'm not saying it's wrong because I am clearly not endorsing child labor, okay, just to be very, very important to make that point. But if we're going to start cherry picking some that seem more important than others. I'm not sure where that ends when, in fact, we've got compliance with it. And I think the borrowers, that's going to be the, a well advised borrower will come back with that challenge. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing. I can see that it's almost so fundamental. But I think the truth there is they're so fundamental to reputation, they'll be clobbered on the equity side anyway. You almost don't need to add to their pain and anguish by giving them an event of default at the same time, causing a spiral across the board and complete disaster. And heading into restructuring, when in fact, number one, they might have just made an error, as in they're not monitoring their policies well enough, and they are now prepared to change and they're doing X, Y, and Z to change it, and you need remedy periods, etc. I think it's a really difficult one because 
are intentionally year after year flouting these regulations. Yes. If, if actually it's a bright line and you've got this problem, you, you then risk actually just totally destabilizing the company and causing a cross default and causing eventually an insolvency. I think, it, I think it's really difficult. <laughs> but you know, interesting enough, um, we're seeing now speaking as an MA lawyer, we see the same thing happening um, with the ESAPs, the action plans that are now being included in shareholder agreements. So those are essentially KPIs. These are the things that you're going to have to comply with and, and sort it out. But now when you make that a fundamental issue that now leads to a, a, an event of default um, in your shareholder agreement, and then you usually will have requirements of you know, the, the fund or, or someone can exit at the premium um, and you post by the shares. That, that also is something that's been heavily negotiated now in SHAs or shareholders agreements, which we weren't doing before. Um, so yes, in the, in, in the times when we're acting for, <laughs> uh, not, not the fund, but the, either the target or the sponsors, whoever is left in the company, this has become a big issue because um, you're telling me I need to uh, do X, Y, Z in relation to improving my risk management. And then that's gonna become a fundamental issue that you say if I default on, you can exit at a premium. Um, uh, so it's interesting you're seeing that, and they and they use the same argument. Um, I'm, I'm I'm not acting when I'm, when I'm wearing the other hat because I also negotiate on both sides, and they say the same thing. These are fundamental. We cannot go back on this, um, and and it's, it's really just a negotiation point. I think you know there, there must be a middle ground. Yeah, if it's so fundamental to the to, to the lender, then there must be an ability to come to a middle ground, which is sort of an action plan. An agreed plan to change this, a period for remedy, uh, announcement publicly, you, you're going to do it. it. It just can't be an immediate event of talk in that sense. But then again, as a borrower, you are giving power to your banks to essentially dictate your policies, which will in any case be dictated by the equity bank and dictated by people buying or not buying your products because they vote with their feet. Great. Any last one, one, one last one, right? Maybe have you working from the back or a or a entity outside Europe that is diabetes will be working with the session line. So that could be, for example, Kenya in the union is still for the same. The question is how how could but, but I think there are, I mean, there are two points there. One is the standalone reporting that you might have to do as, as an entity. The second question, I mean, if you are actually wholly owned or significantly majority owned by a European entity, that European entity is going to be consolidating anyone. Anyway. You're going to need to be describing its business worldwide. So the standards which it puts on its business worldwide are going to need to be filtered down into every subsidiary to then report back up again. So let's be frank about it. It's sort of inevitable because the ownership structure, the, the top code, so to speak, has to report in a certain way that it will expect similar reporting in order to be able to consolidate well and consolidate sensibly what it's saying about its worldwide business. So, so it's sort of inevitable. We, we,
I think the UK has learned, I think mean, Boris would disagree with us, but you can vote to leave the EU with you. Oh, no. <laughs> it's the stupidest decision we've ever made, but I think that's a choice. <laughs> um, I, I think um, that's it <laughs> for now. Um, and I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming here today. Uh, we could have and the invite and come and be talking to ourselves. So we really appreciate you coming here um, and giving us the time to speak with you today. I also want to thank oh, <laughs> Catherine and Robert <laughs> for coming and joining us today morning and sharing with us a lot of like important knowledge. Yeah, if we come again, I'll learn how to use <laughs> No, we'll use my computer next time. <laughs> I'll go to a hotel and <laughs> No, that was sustainable uh, oh, I feel uh, water, water management, right? So. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thank you everyone and have, I, I think, a, a great day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, we can send the material after this. <laughs>